And now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. We are now in the 14th and 15th centuries, better known as the late Middle Ages. It's a time of change, of new economies, new powers, and the shaping of a new kind of state. On the other hand, it's also full of the same old horrors. Endless wars, grinding poverty, deadly plagues. You can call it a time of transition, but all times are times of transition. You can say it's increasingly dynamic, but you wouldn't want to live there. Peasants still accounted for 80 to 90 percent of the population, and they would continue to do so into the 19th century. Nobles and clergy were still rich and powerful, and they would continue to be so for a long time. But trade and the rise of the town had brought basic changes to Europe. Burghers, merchants, city folk in general had introduced the novelties of money, economy, capital, investments, the notions of time and profit and wage labor, and new social divisions and new social tensions came with them. The old society of feudal orders, presumably willed by God, was breaking down. Worse, it was tearing itself apart in wars and civil strife. For example, the long struggle for supremacy between Italian popes and German emperors was weakening the emperors who wasted their energy in foreign conflict when they should have been tending to troubles at home. Words like German and Germany are simply shorthand. The reality was 240 states, hundreds of semi-independent feudal lords, dozens of tough, active towns from the Baltic to the North Sea and along the Rhine and the Danube valleys, as well as the territories of the House of Habsburg in Bohemia and Austria, and few of them got along. In the 14th century, the spotlight turns to France. Here was yet another devastating conflict, the Hundred Years' War, which lasted even longer than its name, from 1337 to 1453, with very few interruptions. The war was a struggle of succession to the French crown, and it was waged between English and French contenders, but also between factions supporting great feudal clans all over France, but especially in Burgundy and Flanders. When the English were finally driven out of France, the country was in ruins. Wolves roamed abandoned villages, orchards and fields, and worse than wolves, were the bands of mercenaries that scoured the countryside for scarce provisions. Untilled lands returned to forest, scrub, or marsh. By the end of the war in mid-15th century, the French population was one-third to one-half what it had been 150 years before. But it wasn't all the fault of the English. For two score years after 1348, the Black Death killed off more people than any fighting could have, as much as half the population in certain places. The figure in the center of this French mural represents death by plague, not war. It's a chilling fact that the number of French homes in 1789 was only 10% greater than it had been in 1328. What was equally bad, the costs of war ate up resources that could have been put to productive use. If you forge swords, you cannot forge plowshares. If you build castles and fortifications, you can't build mills. 
or bridges or roads or rebuild the ones that are being destroyed. And it's not just material goods that are being destroyed. As the fighting drags on, the feudal order itself begins to crack. Feudalism in the first place was about military service. But short service feudal levies were not much use in an endless war. And so armies became more permanent and more professional. The more specialized the soldiers and their armament, and incidentally this is the time when artillery appears, the more money you need for them. The more the crown pressed to introduce taxes, which also strain the fabric of society, because they are not part of any feudal contract, which is about an exchange of goods and services. Monarchies like those in England and France survived this time of troubles by learning to manipulate their aristocracies and, as far as possible, to enlist them in their service. New taxes, which only commoners paid, provided funding for royal patronage that attracted nobles and won them over to the interest of the crown. Of course, taxes also strained the economy further. In the midst of misery and conflict, the conspicuous consumption of the great grew ever more conspicuous. There were costly and vivid garments. There were women's hats so tall that in 1418, the doors of a royal castle in France had to be heightened to allow the queen and her ladies to pass, and this during the worst of the fighting. In spite of such folly, the French managed to drive out the English by 1453 except for one last English outpost at Calais. But this great victory for France was overshadowed that very year by an even greater defeat for the tail end of an empire, Byzantium. At dusk on May the 29th, 1453, the people of Constantinople made for the walls of the city crying to the Virgin Mary for aid. Besieged for 50 days by 160,000 Turks, they didn't have enough men left to man the long walls and to mend the breaches made by 130 cannon and a fleet of 250 ships. One hour after midnight, the Turkish assault began by noon of May the 30th, Byzantium was dead after more than a thousand years. In the West, however, its fall had already been discounted. Europe had other fish to fry. The English were busy in the last half of the 15th century with a civil war of their own, another war of succession it was poetically called the War of the Roses because the emblems of the two parties fighting for the crown were a white rose for the House of York and a red rose for the House of Lancaster. It's a long, dreary tale of murder, slaughter, battles, betrayals, ending in 1485 when the last surviving claimant of the Lancaster line, Henry Tudor, won the Battle of Bosworth and became Henry VII. The only good thing about the war, whose only relationship to roses were the thorns, was that the belligerent aristocracy was nearly decimated. One fifth of the land in England was left without a master and Henry VII reclaimed it as a royal domain, which increased the power of the crown at the expense of the feudal lords. Finally, by the end of the 15th century, Europe began to recover from nearly 200 years of war and plague. Devastated lands were restored, new lands were brought under cultivation, and the cities flourished once again. Small ones like Basel, with 8,000 to 9,000 people, middling ones like Nuremberg, with 25,000, great ones like Cologne, Bruges 
around 50,000, Ghent, and in Italy, the giants, Milan, Florence, Venice, with between 75,000 and 100,000 people each. What the wars of the 14th and 15th centuries had started by killing off the nobility and strengthening the king, these cities were going to continue. Because now a new dynamic social group made its appearance that was profoundly anti-feudal, the middle class. Towns and cities had declined as economy and security declined in the 14th century. In the 16th century, they make a comeback. And newly prosperous townsmen start to assert themselves. In Italy and Germany, where central government was weak or non-existent, they set up what become virtual city-states. In England, and to a lesser degree in France, they become the allies of the crown against the feudal aristocracy. Urban elites don't just make money. They move into positions of power by going into royal administration where they can manipulate patronage. Furthermore, as they increase in number, as trade and the money economy grow, the life of the countryside was affected as well. Urban demands for food and raw materials made it possible for country folk to farm for profit above mere subsistence. Rising prices and a more plentiful supply of money also gave the peasant the means to buy his freedom or to commute his labor services for a money rent or to take off for the cities where, as the saying went, city air makes free. Many things that happened in this period and beyond, including the Renaissance and the Reformation, were symptoms of the development of the urban middle class. It was in the 1300s and the 1400s that ordinary families were endowed with surnames which afforded them a new kind of personality. It was also in this period that more men of low birth began to win recognition and power. And the best example of this is the great Italian war leaders of the 14th and 15th centuries, the condottieri. This is Francesco Sforza, whose family ruled Milan. His father was a farmer. Sir John Hawkwood was the son of a tanner. He became captain general of Florence. He married the daughter of a duke. Erasmo Gattamelata and Bartolomeo Colleoni were commoners who became generals of Venice. Statues of this sort had until then been reserved for Roman emperors, but now commoners could aspire to the honors of kings. Even more significant were the rich burghers who began competing with feudal lords for rank and title. This is Dick Whittington, who made a fortune and became Sir Richard Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. From that time on, Knighthoods in England could be won in the county now. And after 1500, by Tudor times, all the great ministers, like Thomas Cromwell, William Cecil, and their descendants sprang from the new middle classes, not from the feudal nobility. The point here is not that new men came to the fore, because new men are always coming to the fore, and every age is full of newly rich or newly noble people who bring in vulgarity and dynamism and good strong teeth and sharp elbows. The point is the way in which these new men came to the fore, the class they represented and the values for which they stood. Because now, instead of making your fortune by the horse and the sword, you made it by gold and credit and trading and 
And it was no longer the knight who wandered the country, but increasingly the laborer, the apprentice in search of work, now that the feudal order had broken down. And with labor increasingly mobile, employers found the cheap hands with which the great capitalist fortunes of the 15th century were put together. Financial speculation also came into vogue. We read of a dealer in the 14th century who spread a false rumor of war in order to send down the price of wool. And there were endless complaints about engrossing, buying up a whole stock in order to get a monopoly. The respectable grocers of today are the descendants of those engrossers. Men also began to speculate in real estate which hadn't been done since the fall of Rome, and to accumulate farms and to substitute large-scale farming for piecemeal agriculture. Where sheep farming was more profitable than food growing, they would put the land to grass, where acres and acres of grazing could be looked after by a few men and a dog. Tenants were then thrown off the land to increase the great and growing army of potential workers, soldiers, vagrants, and criminals. So, as the saying went, sheep et men instead of the other way round. Or, more to the point, men et each other more voraciously and more ruthlessly than they ever did before. In these processes, we can recognize both the appearance of something like a capitalist economy and the passing away of the Middle Ages. The important thing about this change was not whether it was for the better or for the worse, but that it was change and that it brought into question an immemorial feudal order which people had not thought to question before. Evils that were accepted before were now resented, and resentments that were silent became vocal. In a world where personal fate was no longer graven in stone, the poor were now held responsible for their poverty, and the poor in turn held others responsible, and so Europe entered the age of social conflict. The 14th century especially was full of rebellion. Workers against employers, small business against big business, peasants against lords, everybody against taxes and tax collectors. The most serious revolts were in the towns, because that was where you found a critical mass ready for anything. And it was also where social revolt acquired ideological overtones and turned into heresy against the established teachings of the medieval church. Rebellion was bad enough, but heresy was worse. Unfortunately, the right to expression in Europe was recognized less often than the right to repression. So heresy was often fatal for the heretics, especially when it took the form of a revolt of the poor against authority. To cope with heresy, as well as with poverty, the church responded by founding new monastic orders, notably the Franciscans who took the side of the poor, and the Dominicans, who very quickly took the side against the poor. St. Francis, who lived from 1182 to 1226, was the founder of the Franciscan order. The son of a rich Italian merchant, Francis was something of a playboy in his youth, and when he got religion, his preaching reflected this. It was full of chivalric notions right out of the troubadours. He wooed my lady poverty. 
He made friends with the animals as if he lived in a fairy tale. His tone was good humored and popular, and so were his followers. The founder of the Dominicans was Saint Dominic, who lived from 1170 to 1221. He was a Castilian nobleman, much more sober and austere than Francis, and not playful at all. He was interested in education and spiritual conformity and intellectual conformity. In the 13th century, when inquisitors were appointed to investigate heresy and stamp it out, most of the inquisitors were Dominicans. A Florentine Dominican named Savonarola was probably the most typical successor of St. Dominic in spirit. In 1494, he established a puritanical theocracy in Florence, and he ended up burnt at the stake four years later by the very people who had cheered him on. Perhaps the greatest Dominican, however, was one of the most atypical, Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, who died in 1274. Aquinas was less a preacher and more a philosopher who reconciled reason and faith. According to Aquinas, our understanding of God's will did not depend on some miraculous revelation, rather, God made man reasonable so that he could analyze and handle nature. God also made man free so he could operate within nature and within secular society to the greater glory of God. You can see how well this fitted an age that was still deeply religious, but one in which men were beginning to take their fate into their own hands. But this age was also the age of strife between pope and emperor, between religious and secular power. And ironically, it was Aquinas, the great Catholic theologian, who provided a solid intellectual foundation for a state that was secular and rational, where princes administered a justice that was not purely arbitrary, but based on logical, predictable, codified procedures, as in the Roman law that the 12th century was rediscovering in the new university. Aquinas laid down as a principle that human right was not destroyed by divine right. The Pope was God's vicar on earth, and the church was preeminent in spiritual matters, but in matters of civil good, it was better to obey secular power than spiritual power. And furthermore, law and justice, which Aquinas saw as part of the reason of God, were accessible to us simply by using our own human reason. And this, in turn, meant that law and justice were accessible to all reasoning men, whether Christian or pagan. If you want to press the argument, the light of reason did not depend on the church. It shined over all humanity. And all humanity was part of the same community. Now, to, today, we tend to see this as a cliché. But this community of man was potentially a very subversive thought in an age of rigid social distinctions, as we shall see in our next.